I grew up down in East Tennessee in what we call the Bible Belt, right? I mean, it is just when I was growing up, Christianity was such a subculture that we had Christian music, Christian t-shirts. We even had Christian candy. It was called, I kid, I kid you not, it's called Testaments. Mints with a Bible verse wrapped around them. Testaments. Yeah, and we had these charts that they gave us when we became a Christian that it, it had the secular band, you know, and it said, if you like this secular band, then you'll really like this Christian band. That was like a Christian version of the secular band. But, you, you know, when we burned all of our, uh, well, they, these were cassette tapes in young people. I, these were things we listened to music on. Uh, <laughs> and then we burned our CDs. We burned all of our music and we got the Christian uh, counterfeit. You know, and we listened to this Christian music. And we're like, oh, that doesn't it sound like Metallica. You know, it's not. Anyway, you know, it was this strange subculture, but I can remember it was all very much about just what we believe, that you needed to believe that Jesus died for your sins, rose from the dead, and all of those things became so important to me, and they still are important to me. But I began to see that the church is better at making believers than forming disciples. And there's a very big difference between being a believer in Jesus and being a follower of Jesus, right? As my friend Tony Campolo says, we, we saw a pattern in the church that we all came to the altar singing the old hymn, Just As I Am, and then we left just as we were <laughs> and kept living just like we always had. That, that, that becoming a believer in Jesus didn't always translate into a new lifestyle that was totally reoriented by Jesus. And so what began to happen to me, for me, is I started reading the Sermon on the Mount, started reading the Gospels, and it started really messing with me, you know, because I, I read the things that Jesus said, like, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. <laughs> and I'm going... I mean, did, do, do we really believe he meant this? You know, love our enemies. That, uh, and, and, and I saw Jesus saying that we, if we want to be the greatest, we should become the least because the last will be first and the first will be last. And I, you know, this was very troubling for me just to throw it all out there. I was prom king, which I always say, uh, don't be too impressed. It just shows you what a small town I was from. <laughs> but I was, I was a cool kid. You know, I was, I went to Sunday school. I made straight A's. I was gonna uh, go find a job and make lots of money. And then I heard a pastor say, "If we find ourselves climbing the ladder of upward mobility and status and success, if we find ourselves climbing our way up, we better be careful, or else on our way up." we might pass Jesus on His way down. And as you look at Jesus, you see a God who left all the comfort of heaven to join the struggle here on earth. Right? One who was born into the struggle of the world, who died on the cross, who constantly pulls us towards the margins of the world. And so I, I, you know, I look at, the, uh, uh, at my faith now and there's people that come up to me and they're like, Oh man, you know, I let me tell you my testimony. I, you know, my life was such a mess. I went to jail. I did all this stuff, and then I met Jesus, and everything came together. And and now I'm like, God bless you. You know, for me, I pretty much had my life together, and I met Jesus, and He messed me up. <laughs> you know, like that's where everything flipped on its head. Because I now I look at the kingdom of God, right? That Jesus talks about, and 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 the Scripture says that. The kingdom of God looks like this. The mighty are cast from their thrones and the lowly are lifted. The hungry are filled and the rich are sent away empty. Uh, this kingdom of God is, is upside down, right? It's, 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 it's so different from the values that we're taught in our world. And so if we want to follow Jesus, I'm convinced we've got to be ready to get in trouble. The good trouble that, you know, our civil rights legend John, John, uh, John Lewis, he talked about the good trouble. You know, but I look at so many of the Christians uh, the, through history 
They've been holy troublemakers, right? I think of Jacques Ellul when he says, I don't know where we get the notion that Christians are just meant to be normal, good, law-abiding citizens. Christians at their best have been holy troublemakers, creators of divine mischief, people who refuse to uh, conform to the status quo, who don't accept the world as it is, but insist on building the world that God dreams of, that we're people who are... um, maladjusted you know as dr martin luther king was once accused uh, someone said to martin luther king that he was maladjusted and he embraced the word and he said maybe i am because we live in a world that has become way too adjusted to injustice we live in a world that has become way too adjusted to racism way too adjusted to the inequity between the rich and the poor way too adjusted to violence we need some holy maladjusted people in the world and so i think that's one of our callings as we think of the world that we live in you think of jesus's final account of the judgment right so many of the things that jesus said they 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 challenge the things that we hold dear. And I, I think of one of the most radical is this, these, these verses from Matthew 25, where Jesus gives us the final account of the judgment. And he says that, uh, you, you know, we are going to be judged uh, by God. And it, it, incidentally, it's not just a doctrinal test, right? It's not like God's going to come and say, okay, virgin birth, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree, you know? We might wish it was a doctrinal test. We'd probably do great on a doctrinal test, but we're actually going to be asked in the end, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was in prison, did you come visit me? When I was a stranger, an immigrant, an asylum seeker, did you welcome me in? When I was sick, did you take care of me? In the end, Our faith has to manifest itself in acts of love and compassion to the most vulnerable people in the world. Now, I'm always careful to say that that our works, they don't earn our salvation. Let, Let the Baptist say amen, right? Our works don't earn our salvation. Our works demonstrate our salvation. If we if if we don't visit people who are in jail, if we don't welcome the stranger and care for the homeless, then maybe we're not actually Christians. Maybe we're just worshipers of Jesus on Sunday morning. So this has to transform our life, right? And as I um, have tried to figure this out, you know, over the last 20 years or so in Philadelphia, uh, by the way, I, I wish I could bring all of you to Philly, but I am going to bring one glimpse of Philly to you. This is our front door. At the simple way, the, the little community I've been a part of for the last 20, 20 years or so. And it says, heal our hearts, heal all that is broken in our hearts, in our streets, and in our world. That, that prayer um, integrates the, 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 the concern for those who are vulnerable, right? That... Um, that God is healing individuals, but God is also healing communities. God's healing our streets. God's healing a broken world. So I want to just reflect a little on that because I think sometimes we get imbalanced, right? And we say, oh, this is just about personal salvation, not social justice. Or we say, no, this is just about social justice, not personal salvation. And it has to be both, right? God is personal and God cares about the world. And sometimes I think what we do in the church is that we overcorrect where we've been imbalanced, right? So it's kind of like if you run your car off the right side of the road, you yank the wheel and, you know, run off the left side of the road. Or in in England, you know, you run off the left side and yank it off the right. But, you know, that we we end up overcorrecting what we, 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 we almost uh, uh, exaggerate what we've neglected. And that's what a lot of the heresies were, right? Is they were emphasizing one truth at the expense of another. So I want to say things like faith and works, personal salvation and social justice, they're things that we got to hold together, right? Uh, and and if, if, we can't, if we can't do that, we end up sort of dissecting the gospel and leaving it um, in, in disarray. So as we think of this healing our hearts, one of the reasons 
I have become so involved in restorative justice and ending the death penalty is that I believe one of the fundamental questions of our faith is, is anybody beyond redemption? And there's no better story for me than, than when Jesus uh, encounters the woman who's caught in adultery and she's been drugged before the town and humiliated in public, right? And all of the men have their stones ready to kill her. And they're, you know, arguably they had every right to, to execute this woman. Adultery was a capital crime in their culture. And so they're, they're, they got their stones ready to kill her. And Jesus interrupts the execution. He walks into the circle of these armed men, and the first thing he does is dig in the dirt, which I think is really interesting. You know, he, uh, he, he puts his finger in the dirt and begins to write something, and no one really knows what he, what he wrote, but uh, we were asking some of the children, you know, to speculate, what do you think Jesus wrote in the dirt? And one of the kids said, maybe Jesus wrote, if this doesn't work, run, woman. <laughs> I think that's my favorite answer ever. So we don't know exactly what Jesus wrote in the dirt. Maybe he was just getting a little time. You know, maybe he's writing the names of all the women the guys had slept with. I, I don't know what, you know. But what we do know is what he did next. He looks at all those men and he says, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And of course, he'll remind them and all of us, if you've looked at someone with lust in your eyes, you've committed adultery. If you've called someone a fool, you've committed murder in your heart. And, and all of those men drop their stones and walk away. And the story ends with Jesus and the woman. It's so beautiful, right? And he says to the woman, where'd they all go? And then he tells her to go and sin no more. He, not only does he heal this woman and uh, uh, free her from her sin, but he also transforms this mob of angry, violent men. And as you look at this story, what becomes clear is that no one is above reproach and no one is beyond redemption. That is our gospel, right? That no one is above reproach and no one is beyond redemption. When you look at Jesus interrupting this execution, the only one who had any right to throw a stone has absolutely no desire. And you can see that the closer we are to God, the less we should want to throw stones at other people the more that we have tasted of the grace of God, it should transform us into gracious people in the world. But that, that isn't always the case, is it? That sometimes Christians have been the quickest people to pick up stones, to point fingers. In the United States, this is the tragedy. The Christians, we Christians, have been the biggest supporters of capital punishment. 85% of our executions are happening in the Bible Belt where Christians are most concentrated. And so I've been challenging that. You know, I wrote a book about that a bit because I think what is so important at the very heart of our faith is that we believe Jesus himself said that it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I haven't come for the righteous, but for the sinners. And I want to say today, we need a church that lives like that, right? That we exist for the broken. That uh, the, the church is a place where imperfect people can come and fall in love with a perfect God and then help each other become more and more like that God. But too often, what's happened is Christians have acted like we're perfect, right? And uh, uh, we pointed fingers at everybody else. And so I, I, uh, I love how Tony uh, Campolo, he, he says, uh, when people tell him that the church is full of hypocrites, he says, no, it's not. We've always got room for more. <laughs> and so wouldn't that be beautiful, right? I went to one church I was uh, uh, attending uh, not too long ago, and the people at the door, the greeters, had T-shirts on. Uh, that Instead of just suits and ties, they had T-shirts on, and the T-shirt said, no perfect people allowed. Come on, right? Everybody is welcome as long as you know you ain't got all your stuff together, right? So this, this gospel is good news for those who are broken. And I believe that a hurting world 
is not looking for Christians who are perfect. They are looking for Christians who are honest, who are able to be honest with their struggles, their doubts, their contradictions, and we're each trying to work out the log in our own eyes so that tomorrow we're a little bit less of a hypocrite than we are today. So we need that kind of environment in the church, right? And we need to remember that God is healing hearts. God is healing hearts. God is coming to uh, heal broken people. But then I think also sometimes in the church, we get so focused on ourselves that we forget that the church exists for the world, right? We exist to heal the broken streets of, of our world. One of uh, my friends, who's a wonderful theologian, uh, and his name's Ray Bakke. He wrote a book called Theology as Big as the City. And one of the things he talks about is that how in seminary and church, we talk a lot about exegeting scripture, well, which is a fancy word, you know, for those that didn't go to seminary, you know, that, that um, to read the Bible in the context that it was written. And exegeting scripture is beautiful. But Ray Bakke says, we also have to exegete our neighborhoods. We've got to exegete our world. We've got to ask the question, what does it look like to live out the gospel of Jesus in this place and in this time that we are living in? And we ask the questions, what are the principalities and powers that exist in our uh, neighborhood, in our society that are obstacles to God's love and grace? So that's one of the things that we, you know, have been doing in Philadelphia is asking, you know, what, what are the, 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 the things that we're up against? And for us as Christians, we want to confront those on all sides. So I told you the story um, of Papito or earlier of a, a young man, 19 years old, that was shot and killed on our block. And we've had so many folks that are killed on our, 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 on our streets that we start to say, you know, we need to... Uh, we need to begin to do something about this. So we've had movements around gun violence. We've had movements around immigration to try to, we, we become a sanctuary city in Philadelphia to welcome immigrants and refugees. So we're trying to bear witness of God's love. And one of the things that we're up against in Philadelphia um, has been the opioid crisis. We've, we, we, we're losing about a thousand lives every year to drug addiction. And there comes a point where we want to see that as something that the church cares about, right? So um, we've got a recovery community in Philadelphia that's all, you know, led by people who are recovering from mostly heroin addiction. And on the wall at New Jerusalem, at the recovery community, there's a quote that says, we cannot fully recover until we help the society that made us sick recover. So it's about the personal healing, but it's also about healing, I mean, the economics of heroin. Heroin's the, one of the largest eco economies in our neighborhood. We've lost over 100,000 jobs. We've got uh, 700 abandoned factories in our neighborhood, and heroin in the drug industry is one of those that's come in. And, and so if we're going to tell kids not to sell drugs on our corner, we've got to have an alternative, right, for which, you know, by which they can take care of their family. So we, we, you know, I love how Dr. Martin Luther King said this. He said, the church is meant to be the prophetic conscience of our society. That the, the, the church is meant to be the conscience to wake people up with love and compassion. And part of what we need to do is to uh, expose injustice so that it becomes so uncomfortable that people have to respond. That we make the injustice personal and make it uncomfortable for folks. So I want to share with you something. As we you know, are living in our neighborhood, we began to have heroin needles that were all over our neighborhood. And the kids, I mean, really, there was a breaking point where I remember one of the kids was talking about they were going to have a snowball fight in winter. And yet they were scared that as they were building a snowman or as they were creating snowballs, they were scared they were going to find heroin needles in the snow. And we've had needles that just are on the sidewalk. So we just got fed up, right? And we said, we, we, we got to do something about this. And really inspired by the kids, we had this whole campaign called Need a Little Help. And we gathered the heroin needles 
and we put them in jars and we put epoxy in them and um, and we have quotes from the kids and we delivered these bottles of needles to our politicians, our legislators, to the mayor and the health department and the police commissioner and our city council members. And one of, uh, as we did it, the kids delivered them and they said, we need a little help. And we, you know, this crisis is an emergency, right? You don't have kids in other neighborhoods that are tripping over needles and we shouldn't either. We need to see a, a thousand lives lost every year to, to drugs as a public health crisis. And it wasn't long before our city responded and declared it a, a, an emergency, a public health crisis, and began to mobilize an emergency response. But part of what we had to do, right, was expose the injustice so that people can see the, the human lives that are at stake, right? That we can begin to um, put a name and a face on the pain. As we think of immigration, it's the same, right? One of the most powerful things that we did around immigration was in partnership with our dreamers, our young immigrant families, right? That are still fighting for documentation, for citizenship, asylum seekers that are, you know, escaping horrific things that are just trying to find a better life. And so what we did was um, we had a movement around our country where we gathered 3,000 dreams of immigrant families. And we marched together to Congress and we began to read those dreams out loud. And we heard the testimonies of immigrant families, young people share their stories. And we continued to read those dreams one after another. And we led prayers and eventually the police came and they said on a bullhorn, you can't be here. We knelt down on our knees and we kept reading the dreams of immigrant families and we kept saying our prayers and we were handcuffed we were taken into custody and i'll say that that's the good trouble right that's why uh, uh, even as we were being arrested one of the police officers whispered to us he said thank you thank you for your witness we need immigration reform we need change in our country and so when we went to jail uh, uh, we smiled in our mug shots. And that, as John Lewis said, we can smile in our mug shots because we know that we are on the right side of history. So as we think about what it means to, to seek first the kingdom of God, we're seeking the transformation of the world, right? We're seeking that God's dream would come in our neighborhood, on our block, in our city, on earth as it is in heaven. So God is healing individuals. God is also healing our streets. And that's my prayer too, as you, wherever you're living, that you would start to think, to pray and to seek what would it look like for God's most perfect dream to be realized in our city or in our town. And for us, that meant not losing a thousand lives to heroin, not losing a hundred lives every single day to guns in our country. That's we have a hundred lives a day lost to guns. It looks like not having the death penalty, not, not trying to kill to show that killing is wrong. To seek first the kingdom of God is to seek a society that is realigned with the dream of God. And the last uh, reflection I'll offer you in this healing our streets, healing our hearts, healing our world, is there's that beautiful passage in Romans that says all of creation is groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right? That it gives this vision of a world that is groaning in pain, and I think of that scripture, I think of the environmental crisis, the, the extinction rebellion, those who are raising their voices against the degradation of the earth. But I also think just of that groaning in our country around racial justice, those who are in our streets saying, I can't breathe. There is this groaning. But it's a beautiful image that Romans gives because it's, it's this image of childbirth. And there's a, a wonderful Sikh activist in the United States. She's a lawyer too, Valerie Carr. And one of the things that she says is she had this vision uh, of darkness. And at first she thought it might be the darkness of the tomb. But then she said, but then 
I began to realize maybe it's not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb. Come on, right? That this is not just a place of death, but it's a, a place where we are pregnant with new life. And I think that's the vision of Romans, right? That's the vision of a groaning creation is that there is something new that is being born. There's a new world being born in the shell of the old one. And we get to be the midwives. We get to give birth to a new world. We get to seek the kingdom of God, which means the renewal of, of, of this earth. And so the invitation right now, I think we're living in a time that is groaning, that the earth is groaning, people are groaning. And we get to bear witness that there is a God that is at work in this world. So one of the images that uh, we have really been drawn to is... is uh, where the prophets Micah and Isaiah both cast this vision of a world where God's people will beat their swords into plows and their spears into pruning hooks, right? That we will literally transform this world from a world of death into a world of life. That we would transform metal that is designed to kill into metal that is designed to cultivate life. So we don't have a lot of swords in the U.S., but we got more guns than people. We have a lot of guns. And so we begin to invite people to donate guns. And as some of y'all may know, we, we've literally been um, transforming guns into garden tools. And that inspired by that image of, uh, you know, beating swords into plows. So I, I brought you a few visuals here. This is one of the plows that I made, one of the ones that we've made out of a donated gun and even this uh, wood is made from the wood stock of the gun this is a shovel that's made out of a gun and the wooden handle made out of the gun there's these this cross which uh, I made out of the barrel of a gun these uh, necklaces that are made out of the slice of a gun barrel that we crush into these hearts and every time we do it we pray for and remember the lives that have been crushed by violence. It's that image with G the early church said, this idea of transforming uh, our swords into plows is what Jesus did with the cross. This horrific image of death and torture, imperial execution is now transformed into a conduit of God's love and grace. And we Christians, the early Christians said this, that we Christians are to be people who are transforming the world, beating swords into plows, that we're tr turning a world of death into life. And, and uh, the, the wonderful Walter Brueggemann wrote a, um, a book called The Prophetic Imagination. He, he said, sometimes we think of the prophets as if they were fortune tellers, you know, trying to predict the future. But the prophets, they were actually truth tellers. They weren't trying to, to predict the future. They were trying to change the future by naming the truth about our present, by waking us up and inviting us to live into a different future than where we're headed right now. And so we are to be that prophetic people, right? To... to uh, not just accept the world as it is, but to dream of the world as it should be and to build that world, to begin beating our swords into plows, to welcome immigrants and refugees, to, uh, to, to bring concrete back to life and plant urban gardens. This is the stuff that we do. And so I, I want to you know, invite you as we think of what it means to be the people of God right now, that we should be feeling that groaning but that we should know that this darkness is not the darkness of the womb, but the darkness of the tomb, that a new world is being born. And we get to be the midwives. We get to be a part of a God who is healing. We get to participate with God in healing hearts, loving people back to life. We get to participate in healing streets and healing this world. May it be so. May we be Christ's hands and feet. May God's kingdom come and God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May it come in your neighborhood as it is in heaven. May the kingdom come in your heart and in your streets 
and in our world. Amen.